So, welcome back. Before we start with this, some little feedback update. You all checked on your first milestone. Good, excellent. Because uh, I'm, I, I heard of at least one guy who didn't, who didn't submit anything. So hmm, we'll see. Any questions up to now? All good so far? You, you talk to your various advisors. Yeah. Got some feedback. Excellent. That's as, as it should be. So let me plunge that. In. Okay. Um, any questions from what we discussed last week? Makes it made sense so far. Good. Excellent. So I'd like to continue this discussion today by zooming out a little bit. So last time we talked about individual sentences, right? You remember this little Red Riding Hood's walk uh, was occurred, took place, blah, 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 right? Mm, okay. So what I now want to do is to see how we go from individual sentences to paragraphs. Readable paragraphs that take the reader by the hand and guide the reader from one sentence to the next in a plausible fashion. To do that, let's do a little recap. Um, so to warm up, we talk again a little bit about characters, how that relates to clarity. Uh, I think we started this section, but didn't quite complete it yet, if I'm not totally mistaken. I think we're somewhere there in the middle. Um, so let's see. Um, the, the, the reminder for that is um, characters as subjects of the, of the sentence, right? So the content should match the grammatical structure. Um, and sometimes the issue is, well, where do you find them? Um, I think we had this example, right? Or not? No? OK, so let's, let, let's look at this example. Um, governmental intervention in fast, sorry, I got new glasses. I'm not quite used to them yet. Um, uh, governmental intervention in fast changing technologies has resulted in distortions of market evolution or interference in the development of products. Of new, new products. Make sense? Typical question, what's the action, what are, what are the characters? What is happening and who is doing it? Intervention. Intervention is something that's happening, right? Oh, oh, it's already done there, okay. So, government intervenes, right? Governmental intervention is a needless nominalization, so don't do that, kick it out. Mm. Distortions, again, you, that needs some thinking, right? You need to, to link this back to see, oh, it's the government that, that distorts. Um, it's the market evolution, right? It's a nominalization again, so it's markets that evolve, etc., etc. The development of new products, that's not so obvious, right? This is not so obvious who develops these new products. So one case could be, you could make a case that it's the market that develops, but does a market develop a product? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit far-fetched. You probably could defend it from, from the logic of the sentence. You probably could defend it to say that, well, it's the market that develops development. But to me, it sounds a bit odd. Right, the market doesn't develop anything, maybe, maybe. So, so there's a character sitting somewhere that's not explicitly mentioned, right? So it, it sort of got lost. It got lost in writing a stilted style. It became not so clear who is actually doing this development. And that's something that sometimes happens that these characters actually disappear. And when you then want to go back from something like that and, and you, you, you catch yourself writing stuff like this, now you need to scratch your head and think again, okay, who was I thinking of, of when I wrote this? Or who was the author here? Here's speculation thinking. I think I got a nicer example for that. Here, um, a decision was made in favor of doing a study of the disagreement. Who decided? Who made that decision? And who studies? Now, that may be okay. Maybe it's clear from context of the rest of the text. Maybe it's not relevant, but typically, typically, Somebody decided. It's also nicer to read, right? You're much more down to earth. Um, 
similar example. There are good reasons that account for the lack of evidence. Typical sentence by a student in the master thesis defense who says, I, I don't know what's going on. That's not what you want to say. So there are good reasons that account for the lack of evidence. Uh, yeah, can you account for it? For the, these reasons. So I can explain, we can explain, uh, my colleague can explain, whoever, right? But you can give me the person who's Let's look at an example. Please rewind. <laughs> Think about characters that are not explicitly stated in the sentence and speculate. Speculate who are these characters and come up with a nicer, more concrete version. Decisions about forcibly administering medication in an emergency room setting, despite the inability of an irrational patient to provide legal consent, is usually an unseen medical decision. So what's going on there? Think of this as a movie scene, right? A patient doesn't want to be administered medicine and then the doctor is assuming whether whether he should forcibly do it or a doctor, yeah. a nurse, a physician, whoever, right? Let's say a doctor. Where's the doctor in here? It's gone, right? It's Decisions, uh, an unseen medical decision. Decisions are non despite the ability. It's, it's totally not clear, right? So at some point, you, in, in such a case, you need to be radical, right? You need to think about, okay, this is a scene, think of it as your movie scene, TV show, emergency room, irrational patient, blah, and then you take the, you take the siren, <laughs> ram it in, right? That's, and this person ramming it in, that takes the decision. Possible revision, I don't know. When doctors decide in an emergency room to forcibly administer medication to the rational patient who cannot provide legal consent, they usually decide based on unseen medical reasons. Something like that. That's probably even my suggestion. Own up. Own up in your text who is doing stuff. This is. So we have characters in our text who are actually doing that. Now, when characters are doing that, doing stuff, you often, in most languages, most, most languages have uh, two voices, um, the active voice and the passive voice. And for, for a character, that's the question to ask you, right? So active voice, I lost the money. Passive voice, the money was lost by me. Ignore what's down here for the moment. Which one is better? Built in your high school career mercilessly, right? Active voice, right? Active voice, active voice, active voice. Why? Why? Why did you immediately say active voice? Because you was told, you were told by your high school teachers, and just accepted that, and knew when to say it, when to say it. My answer would be, it depends. It depends what you want to say. What's the difference between these two sentences? If you think of this in a, in a broader context. Where's the emphasis? Okay, depends also on how you, how you say it. For the active voice, it's only I. Mm -hmm. And for the passive voice, the money. I lost the money, not you. The money was lost, not the car keys. The money, right? It depends where you move emphasis. Is it true? I lost the money. The money was lost by me, not by my sister. So hard to say, right? Where is emphasis in a typical English sentence? At the start or at the end? If you read it with, with voice in spoken language, you can do a lot of stuff. Like, I lost the money. You lost the money. I lost the money. Right? Spoken language gives you a lot of options to do that. We're talking 
text, right? Where you don't have all the voice modulation and etc. as you discourse. So if you if you just read the text. Do you remember? What does the reader remember from the sentence? Yeah. Yeah, because it comes last. What you keep in mind is typically the end, because it's not so long ago that you read it. The start is longer ago. This is gets picked out of memory. You know this this adage that that the human mind can remember seven things. Yeah. The eighth thing picks out the oldest. It's it's a FIFO queue. We have a FIFO queue of depth seven in our mind. And anything gets pushed back out, and there's probably some truth to it. I'm not sure if it's exactly seven or so, but there's probably some truth. So probably the end is something to think about. We'll we'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, okay, so that that that's that's maybe to keep in mind. Still, I agree that in many circumstances, this sounds more like people would actually talk. When was the last time in everyday conversation that you consciously used a passive voice distortion? Think back today. Did you today use a passive voice? Anything you said today? Actually, German is probably more prone to passive voice than English. So, German native speakers may, may have probably a stronger tendency. And this, this clearly doesn't work across all languages, right? There, there's very much there's this difference. So what I understand from, from Chinese colleagues, from people speaking Chinese, Chinese does have a passive construction if you really want to look at the grammatical structure, but it's basically never used. So it's, it's, this, this, this distinction doesn't make any sense or doesn't make much sense to, to, to Chinese native speakers. We don't have one now, so that would be nice to understand. Um, German, actually, the passive voice is not so great. More common than in English, so there, 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 there's a spectrum, right? But since we are focusing on English, English is sort of something in the middle. It has a passive; it is used. And if you look at the texts that you've been reading, I'm sure you saw quite a lot of passive sounds, more than you use in everyday voice, in everyday speaking, right? Why? Why is this scientific passive? Where does that come? By me, so I guess the, 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 the explanation is probably much simpler. Um, it sounds fancy, specifically because it doesn't sound like everyday speech. So, hey, I am a scientist, I don't speak like everybody, right? This kind of uh, approach again. Um, and you can hide characters, you can hide the, the acting character and so distance yourself. School, we learned to write a passive in passive for in the chemistry and physics lessons to uh, focus on the thing that happened and not on the person who did that. And why would we do that? Because it's not important who did that. Is it? In some cases, it is, and in some cases, it's not. In some cases, it is, and in some cases, it isn't. When is, is it important who did it? Hmm. It makes a difference if who did it? If it makes a difference. I did this experiment. I did it. Not anybody else. I'm the first guy who did this experiment. It makes a difference. Also, if you do something differently than others, if there is a if there is a decision that you take in doing this experiment, this simulation, etc., then I think you should put your first person there. I think it's actually cheating. This is let let me jump forward since it just uh, fits here. This objective passive. The science guy is like this objective passive, exactly in this sense. It doesn't matter who is doing the experiment. This is objective science. It will always be done like that. It will always be the same result. There is no subjective influence. This is science. It's repeatable. Hence, we should not emphasize the person. That's sort of the, the line of thinking. This is bullshit. This is nonsense. Of course it matters. Of course it matters who does it. And you should know not. This is my experiment. This is your experiment. You should take responsibility for that and not hide behind the grammatical construction. So all these seemingly objective things are highly suspicious. This is 
experiments were done, they happened uh, on their own, mysteriously, magically, uh, in chemistry, some liquid dropped into another liquid and it exploded. Um, no, 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 it wasn't me. I, I, it wasn't me who did not read the safety instruction. This was, um, happened on its own, right? No, no, no. Um, this is you who took decisions to do it like that. This has nothing to do with this. has nothing whatsoever to do with repeatability, objectiveness, etc., etc. That's a totally different discussion. This is, this is a, this is a mock-up, right, which comes from the field. So, whenever somebody tells you, you should not write I or we in science, Ask them a very simple question. Ask them why. In 90% of the cases, they cannot give you an answer. They will just say, because it's done like that. And anybody who says why and answers because, uh, don't take me seriously. Because is not an answer. Right? So, I or we are perfectly legitimate. There's nothing wrong to say I. When you write your masterpieces, write I. Whenever it fits. Now, there is indeed a justifiable distinction, um, and that is typically called meta discourse. Meta discourse is when you write about your own text in the sense of um, in the next chapter, the following will be discussed. That's the passive tense part. In the next chapter, I will discuss, I will describe, I will explain, blah, blah, blah. There's nothing who else is going, who else wrote this text if not you, right? Say I. If you're multiple authors, say we. That's also okay, right? Can you say we in your masterpieces? Why not? It's your thesis, right? It's your thesis, it's not your advisor's thesis, joint review. Very rarely, there are joint masterpieces. It's extremely rarely. One, once, once in a blue moon. Okay, there, there's one exception when you can write we in a masterpieces. High nobility, if you are related to the British Green or something, then you can write we. We, Queen of England, decide to run this experiment like that, right? Uh, King of England, let's say. Uh, okay, then, then write we. Uh, anybody of you high mobility? No, good. So let's take the line. Um, there's a danger, however, that when, when you start doing that, when you start saying, okay, I do it like that, blah, 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 there's a danger to sort of overshoot and then to hide behind hatches. You're hatching your text. I, I think, I feel, I believe, I conjecture, I have the opinion that, blah, blah, blah. That, that's also, that's just weak. That just weakens your text. You're, you're hatching your facts, and that, that's not nice. It's, it's not like that, or it is like that. No, the, not these gas stories. So if you look at first-person usages, you find typically three cases. And that is we, in particular, the plural case. We, the authors, or I, the author. I, the author, did the following thing. I, the author, decided to arrange my text in the following fashion. Hold on, blah, blah, blah. This is always acceptable. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, when you go into the direction, I have now the right insight that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Then we are in this discussion. Then if you are stating objective truth, that is also clearly established objective truth, in an I fashion, then it gets weird. Right? Then, no, this is not your discovery that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Calm down. So careful there. Don't 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 state trivialities or established facts in this sense. This sounds strange. Okay. Um, what you can also say is we, where the we refers to I the author, you the reader. Mad guys love this. We shall now go on a journey to this pool. Right? We shall now jump together to blah blah blah. Right? Yeah, I suppose. I suppose there's nothing wrong with it. Personally, I find it a little bit odd, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't get excited about it. So that's fine. Such an inclusive, including, including we is okay. Sometimes you find the opposite thing. Sometimes you find excluding we. We, all the guys who know about that and are smart and intelligent, as a 
opposed to you stupid me. That's insulting, right? Don't, don't insult the reader. We who know all this, as we all know, right? When I read that sentence, I immediately get upset. Right? As we all know, no one don't know. That's why I'm reading the text. So don't do that. It's just plain insulting. OK. Um, so nothing wrong with I whenever you talk about your text as such. I start the next chapter by explaining the following thing. Perfectly OK. Also, when you explain where you took decisions, then please write I, by all means. When you decide that, OK, because of all these arguments, I will now choose the following approach. Then this is not an objective, absolutely mathematical, derivable thing. It's your decision, then say so. Don't hide behind your text. Don't hide behind a passive construction or something like that. It's just, just coward. It's just a coward uh, approach. OK, um, so this, this strongly argues in favor of doing I's and we's, and that sounds like an active voice, right? So when you choose the active or the passive voice, and there's no simple answer, that highly depends on consistency of your text to make it nicely readable. I'll come, I'll show you an example for that in a second. Um, maybe before we do that, let's, let's do an I and we example again and a character thing. Let's look just at the first example. Um, it is believed that a lack of understanding about the risk of alcohol is a cause of student binging. I should replace student by something else. To binge, consume alcohol in excessive amounts, right? Rephrase. You see the problem, right? You're, you're stuck on the obvious problem. Who believes? Make up something. Do you believe that students are not with a healthy lack of understanding of the risk of alcohol? So you still have the it is believed. I want to get rid of the it is believed. Who believes? You? I? The community of savages and, sa and savants? Who believes? The text doesn't tell us. I want to know. Make some, some assumptions. Scientists, fine, good. <laughs> scientists is always good, right? <laughs> Wild card, scientists, <laughs> Joker. <laughs> so, scientists believe. scientists believe is a good start, right? Scientists believe that. that an action hiding behind this one realization? Who, what, what's the action? What's the verb to understanding? Express your uh, kind of uh, opinion. Oh, no, no, no. Here, understanding. Okay. What's the verb for understanding? Understand. 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 To understand. Understanding is the nominalization. It's also the German, but it's also the nominalization. Lack of understanding. This is a noun. There's a verb hiding inside, right? To understand. So who understands? A lack of understanding. Also, who, who the scientists don't understand? Who, who is not understanding something here? Students. <laughs> say so. The sentence should say so. It, it takes two coward decisions. It doesn't tell me who believes, and it doesn't tell me who understands, or who doesn't understand. Right? It, it hides this information from me. It hides these two facts from me. I hate that. I want to be so we already agreed that scientists believe. Are the scientists also the guys who don't understand? Guess not. I just believe that you know, of course, of course, <coughs> students also do not understand about the risk of alcohol. 
We don't lack like students, right? Sustainability, merk noun. Merk noun. Scientists believe that. What do they do and what do they not do? These students. They do one thing and they don't, and not, not another. Understanding um, her now. What do they do? Positive. Let's start with the positive part. What do they actually do in this two sentence, two lines? They binge. Binge, you can turn, they drink, or they binge, or drink, or whatever, right? But let's say drink. So they drink, okay? And what else? They do not understand. They do not understand the risks. Exactly. So scientists believe that students do not, do not understand the risks of alcohol. No, 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 no. The other way around. Right? That might also be true, right? That's sort of causing the cause effect. This is the other way around. So how about turning it around? Makes the sentence much easier. Scientists believe that students drink too much because they do not understand the risk. Thank you. Isn't that much simpler and clearer and tells you all that you want to know rather than this, it is believed, a lack of understanding. Whenever you leave a lack of, that's an immediate alarm signal. Merp, merp, merp. Danger. Bad text ahead. It's usually a good sign that somebody isn't owning up to the text, is withholding information. That, that's, that's sort of a warning phrase. And so on, right? The creation of a database is being considered. By whom? Maybe clear from context, but, but really, just say so. The committee, the scientists, uh, the president, whatever. I don't, I don't know. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't be told who is considering that. But no estimate has been made by whom. And again, the word here is to estimate, not the estimate. But nobody has estimated the cost. Something like that. Regarding the potential of its usefulness. Regarding the potential of its usefulness. Simpler, in simpler words, so your, so your five-year-old brother, sister, niece, nephew, whatever understands? Regarding its usefulness. Regarding its usefulness. How to complicate it. Whether it's useful. If it's useful. Useful. This nominalization. Get, get rid of this. Get rid of this. Just ugly. No, sorry. Wrong one. Okay. So far so good? Characters. Put in these bloody characters. Now, which order? Passive or active voice? Absolutely good. And the, the, the key decision is, yes, active voice often sounds nicer. We are, we all, we've all been taught that. But you cannot think of a sentence in isolation. And this part here now talks about sentences as part of a paragraph. How they fit into a paragraph, how they, how they merge in a paragraph. Bigger, how they build a bigger whole. <coughs> Excuse me. And there's two phrases here that's cohesion and coherence. That describe two, two properties of such a paragraph. Cohesion describes how sentences, how a sequence of sentences moves from one sentence to the next. So whether they connect to each other, whether the end of one sentence connects to the start of the next sentence. Paragraph is called cohesive or has cohesion if these sentences link to each other. The end of the first one links to the second start, second end to the third start, and so on. Think of it as Lego blocks, right? Ideally, your sentences are little Lego blocks where the end of one sentence has has sort of a bumper sticking out, and the next one has jump, fits together nicely, carries it along. Coherence is a bit more complicated. 
coherence is the notion that in a paragraph, your sentences all have sort of a narrative attitude. There's these characters again, right? A sentence has a character who is doing so. It can be there explicitly, it can be gone, it is believed there, but each sentence sort of has such a, such a character who is doing so. Maybe two if it's a complicated sentence, right? Now, if you look at the set of a paragraph as a whole, each sentence has characters. Now, if each of your sentences has a new character or new sets of characters, that's difficult to follow. That's like a TV stories where you where you end up with more and more and more actors, and at some point you go, oh, who is that again? No Game of Thrones, right? This is oh, okay, yet another family? Wait. <laughs> Much simpler, the story stays much simpler if you restrict the set of acting characters. Right? That's coherent. Don't overdo it with a new character. Keep the number of characters small, keep the number of things your sentences talk about, keep that small within a paragraph. In a new paragraph, by all means, you can switch. Sometimes you want to talk about other stuff, granted. But don't, don't go crazy inside a paragraph by constantly changing perspective. That's the idea of coherence. The beginning of these sentences, if, if they change and change and change, that gets confusing. If that stays limited, typically paragraphs are easier to follow. Okay? Let's look at some examples. Let's look at cohesion. We have the following sentence once in an active voice and once in a passive voice. The active voice is, the collapse of a dead star into a point, perhaps no larger than a marble, creates a black hole. You know, supernova, bang, and, and collapse, gravitational collapse, there, there's your black hole, right? Nice, clear sentence, isn't it? You've got a clear actor, the collapse, whoop, um, the point, perhaps no larger, creates a black hole. Okay, it's clear work, nice. Nothing, nothing wrong with this. Situation. The passive voice version of this is, a black hole is created by the collapse of a dead star into a point perhaps no larger than a marble. Okay? Exactly the same thing, just to run object and subject. So we got the passive voice version, the version of it. Given the choice between these two sentences, left version, right version, I guess you all go for the left version, right? Probably. No? Why not? More scientific. It reads more scientific, okay. <laughs> let's, let's put it into context. So there's space before and after. So there's a there's sentence coming here and sentence coming here now, right? The sentence before and after read, some astonishing questions about the nature of the universe have been raised by scientists studying black holes in space. The collapse of a dead star into a point perhaps no larger than a marble creates a black hole. So much matter compressed into so big volume changes the fabric of space around it and cost them more. Version one. Version two. Some astonishing questions about the nature of the universe have been raised by scientists studying black holes in space. A black hole is created by the collapse of a dead star into a point perhaps no larger than a marble. So much matter compressed into so big volume changes the fabric of space around it. Which version makes more sense? Which make, they make exactly the same amount of sense. Which version is easier to read? Why? Why the second one? It's pretty easy, right? Exactly the same. So you end with black holes in space, and the second sentence takes this up. A black hole is blah 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 blah. Into a point perhaps no larger. Star point no larger than a marble. Not exactly the same wording, it's not black hole, black hole, but okay, the, 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 the semantic idea. Lots of stuff into small volume. So much matter compressed into solid volume. Takes up the end of the previous sentence and carries it on. Right? This is exactly what cohesion looks like. You pick up where the previous sentence left off. 
if you don't do this occasionally, nothing, no problem with that. People can accommodate. But if this goes wrong continuously in the text, it gets tiring. It's tiring and annoying to me because basically what you're doing here mentally, your, your brain has to stop reading, go back in its stack of the things it memorized, and that takes time, right? So it's, it's a 0.1 second uh, disturbance, but it is. Studying black holes in space, okay, fine. The collapse of a dead star, dead star, dead star, what dead star? Um, okay, maybe something will clarify later into a point where it's not larger than Marble, which marble? What's he talking about? Creates a black hole. Oh, black hole, black hole. I remember black hole. There was something about black holes recently. Going back, going back, scroll back. Oh, there, there it is, right? And of course, this takes place subconsciously. You don't think about this deliberately, and it's a 0.1 second thing, but it still happens. Your brain has to go through that mental process. So for a reader, this is okay if it's once, but not so nice if every cent every paragraph has to stop. Make sense? Excellent. Um, so what this boils down to is two, two simple principles for cohesion. You start your sentences with stuff your reader is familiar with. Ideally, stuff your reader is recently familiar with. Right? Stuff that is just on the top of the stack of, of, your, of your reader's mind. And conversely, because you also want to talk about new stuff occasionally, that's nice in the text, right? Well, if, it can't, if you can't put the new stuff at the start of the sentence, you have not so much choice, you put it at the end of your sentences. You end your sentences with unfamiliar, unanticipated information. The new stuff goes at the end. And basically all you need to think about for this cohesion theory. And then you can go from Lego block to Lego block to Lego block. That's fairly, fairly straightforward idea. Okay, what an exercise? That's a bit longish. Two aims the recovery of the American economy and the modernization of America into a military power were in Wagon's mind when he assumed the office of the presidency. The drop in unemployment figures and inflation and the increase in the GNP, plus, plus national product, uh, testifies to his success in the trips. But our increased involvement in international conflict without any clear set of political goals indicates less success for Griffith II. Nevertheless, vast increases in the military budget and a good deal of saber rattling pleased the American king. Device, improved cohesion. Focus on the first and second sentences. What do we end with at the first sentence? Two aims. The recovery of the American economy, where on Dragon's mind. Do we continue in the remainder of the paragraph? Do we remainder anything with Dragon's minds and then he assumed the office of the president? Is this thought taken up anytime soon? Is it a good idea then to end with this? 
that's going to make it difficult to fill the fridge afterwards, right? So maybe, maybe it's a better idea to pull this up front and to put the aims at the end, because we then continue like the first and the second that clearly refers to these two aims. So maybe it's a better idea to push these two aims towards the end, so then your net following sentences can easily pick up on these two, right? Sound plausible? So how about something um, uh, when not, when Reagan assumed the office of the presidency, two aims were on his mind. Recovery of the German economy and the modernization of America into a uh, military power. Right. How do you then continue? Do you then continue with the dropping unemployment figures and inflation and blah blah blah? Yeah, I mean, uh, I would ex explicitly take up the first aim, right? That's what you end with. Uh, Reagan's mind, office, blah, 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 two aims, colon, blah, and blah, two aims. The first aim was successful, or he achieved the first aim, which is also not so, already not so nice. The first aim was achieved testified, as testified by the drop in unemployment figures, testified, witness, I would say, as witness, as witness or as illustrated by the drop in unemployment figures and inflation and the increase in the GDP. Done. <laughs> Next. The second piece. Drive it home, make it blunt. Language is a very blunt instrument. Use it like that. It's not a stiletto or something. Hit the reader on the head with a very big club. Right? The first aim, the second aim. Don't make it fancy, don't make it complicated, drive it home. Clearly say out loud. Don't be like, never ever. Typical beginner mistake, writers think that readers are smart. They're not. You cannot assume that. Read, writers also assume that, people, that readers are away not, that they are motivated, that they are interested, they never are, right? Assume the worst about your reader, right? And, and write for the worst possible reader. They are lazy, they are tired, they didn't have coffee, it's after lunch, they are about to doze off, they don't really care about the text. Don't make it complicated, don't make it fancy, make it simple, right? The first aim, the second aim, clearly spell it out, right? In the first, in, who, who knows what this is? And then, then you, you get this a little bit more organized, right? John Reagan's mind was on two aims, blah and blah. The first aim, successful because we blah, blah, blah. Could also, again, write down the drop in unemployment figures. Here, the drop. Nominalization, it's not a bad one because to drop or the drop, almost the same. The increase in blah, blah, blah. Can now, we could now go on and, and re, re, reconstruct these sentences and go to verb constructions rather than normalization constructions, but I think we got the idea, right? So please, when you write your texts, write them. By all means, write them. I'm, I'm a believer in, 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 um, in re rewriting and chapters. Write, I, I also, when I write texts, I just write. I dump it out of my brain and get it on paper. And then I don't look at it again, and two days later I, I revise it. Right? So, but then watch out for stuff like that. Watch out for stuff like that. This is easy to fall into the trap because you can write, you know your stuff, you are aware, you have interesting thoughts, but your reader doesn't. This is not nice for your readers. Excellent. Um, so, cohesive sequences, Lego blocks fitting together. But uh, we need coherency. Coherence is this, this notion of characters. Which characters exist in a paragraph? Ideally, few, not many. Actually, this is also going towards this idea of few characters. First aim, second aim, right? 
not here, the drop in unemployment. Look, look, at, look at the characters, right? Two aims, the drop in unemployment, increase in GNP, increased involvement. This is terrible. This is confusing. You got a new, a new thing doing stuff, dropping, increasing, whatever. Hit every sentence. It's totally confusing. So coherence says for a paragraph to be nicely readable, the reader should have an easy time to find the topics of these sentences, simple grammatical structure, your grammatical subject and your content wise topic. Topic is a content idea, it's about semantics. Grammar is about your syntax, right? Your subjects and your topics should coincide, topics as characters. And the amount of concepts, the amount of topics you have in a paragraph should be small. Try to organize your, your sentences such that you don't switch always from a new to, to a new paragraph, uh, to, to, to a new topic. So let's look at an example. Again, that's a bit longer. Particular ideas towards the beginning of sentences define what a passage is about to a reader. Moving through a paragraph from a cumulatively coherent point of view is made possible by a sequence of topics that seem to constitute a limited set of related ideas. Okay. A seeming absence of context for each sentence is one consequence of making random shifts in topics. Feelings of dislocation, disorientation, and lack of focus in the passage occur when that happens. What's he saying? Hard to pinpoint, right? Lots, lots of stuff happening in this, happening in this passage. And that's exactly an example of this. Every sentence starts with a new structure. The particular ideas, moving through a paragraph, point of view, absence of context, feelings of dislocation, right? So every, every, every sentence has a new vantage point, every sentence has a new point of view. Can we change that? Is, is this just the nature of this, of this content? Of course we can. Here's a reword, the same paragraph. Readers look for the topics of sentences to tell them what the whole passage is about. If they feel that its sequence of topics focuses on a limited set of related topics, then they will feel they are moving through that passage from a cumulatively coherent point of view. But if topics seem to shift randomly, then the readers have to bring each sentence from no coherent point of view, and when that happens, readers feel dislocated, disoriented, and the passage seems out of focus. It's about topics, it's about mostly about readers, Readers, they, they, topics, readers, readers. And that's it, right? So basically, this is a passage, this is a paragraph about readers and what happens to them when they read the paragraph. This is, this is the adventure of readers, right? Maybe not good enough to turn it into a Hollywood movie. Yeah, at least, but at least we know who is doing stuff here. In here, I don't. I, I don't get this paragraph. Not easily, I have to read this three times. That I understand. Readers do something, they are happy, they are not happy, etc. Right? Straight to the point. Make sense? Still skeptical. Kind of. Yeah. More examples, right? More examples. Probably the most complicated examples we have in, in this entire discussion. Give it a try. The bold facing gives some hints, right? 
So what's this passive paragraph really about? Education, not. Does it look like it from the grammar structure? Okay, vegetation, fair enough. Plains and rivers, ocean, lakes, sidewalks, humans, earth, earth. Oh, but it's about vegetation. Sure, of course. I mean, it really jumps at you. So, basically, idea could be restructure all these sentences so you tell this from the this sounds silly, but you tell this from the vegetation's perspective, right? And I, it might be easy to read. Little exercise for you. Vegetation covers the earth, except blah, blah, blah. Plants grow mo most, and this is easy, right? Plants grow most richly where earth, uh, plains and river valleys are richly fertilized. Or in, in, uh, to complicate things. They grow mostly in the part where plains and river valleys Too complicated also. In the plains and river exactly. Plants grow most richly in fertilized, richly, richly, yeah. Grows most richly in fertilized plains and river valleys. Bang, done, simple. Right. But also, you dare yourself perpetual snow in high, high, high mountains. Uh, yeah, yeah. Vegetation is dense uh, at the edges of the ocean and lakes and swamps. Uh, plants. Plants exist in busy city sidewalks as well as in seemingly barren places, etc. etc. Right? It, it, it's actually easy to, to, to swap this around and there you go. And then plant, plant, vegetation, plant, plant. Right? You guys know this TV this BBC series um, Our Planet? Richard Attenborough as the narrator. Can you imagine Attenborough reading this paragraph? Really? I can't. But such another one. Plants, 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 vegetation, plants, vegetation, plants, plants. That works. That works. That's that's good for TV audience to hear. And what's good to hear is good to read. So there you go. Okay. I admit that coherence takes practice. That takes experience, that takes uh, that's nothing that, that jumps jumps at you. So um, when while you are at it, when when you are at it and, and restructuring text, also get rid of other fluff. Typical fluff is some throat clearing. <coughs> uh, rhetorically, you can do a throat clearing by by having phrases at the start of a sentence. And therefore, politically speaking, in Eastern states since 1980. Acid rain has become a serious problem. Acid rain is what this thing is all about. We get told acid rain at times, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. After nine words, we come to the topic. And then the sentence is almost over. And so this is, <coughs> I don't <coughs> quite know what to say. So let me throw in some empty, meaningless phrases. Oh, acid rain. Yes, I remember. Acid rain has become a serious problem. Please, why don't we start? Okay, since 1980, I would even drop it there for you. Since 1980, acid rain has become a serious political problem in Eastern states. Get to the point. That's the whole message here. Get to the point. Don't don't keep keep them waiting, right? Okay. Um, therefore, I would even drop therefore all this. Thus, therefore, however, and moreover, in this respect. Within this context, 95% of all this can be dropped. When, 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 my, when my guys give me a text to proofread or to, to write an opinion about, I basically, I don't, before I even read, well, not literally, but almost, I go to all the however's and cross them out. They're usually not necessary. They're usually superfluous. And don't add them. With all this, Therefore, spots, however, etc. Sparingly, yes, I'm not saying they're wrong, but sparingly. Not every second sentence needs a however. However is probably the most overused of all of them. Therefore, consequently, as, a, as an effect of blah, blah, blah. Come on, write your sentence simply and, and, and this is all clear. Okay. Um, 
Okay, excellent. So, one last thing. One, one more thing I want to emphasize. We already covered that, basically. Um, let me even skip that. We basically already agreed that move the new stuff to the end. But the new stuff is also the stuff that is complicated or complex because it's new. By the virtue of being new, this is something that you cannot know. So your new stuff and, and possibly the complicated grammatical structure, complex phrases, go also towards the end. Keep the start simple, coherent in a paragraph. The start is always more or less the same. Link it together with the previous and all the complicated stuff go to the end. And that's, that, then you're in good shape. So basically, your sentence layout is quite simple. You have the topic at the start, short, simple, familiar. Nothing that surprising. Hence, nothing that takes emphasis. Right? Because it's familiar, it's not surprising. That's not what people watch out for. Stress goes to the end of the sentence, to the new stuff, possibly the longer stuff, possibly the more complicated stuff. And that's where you end up with a rhetorical emphasis. And that's good, because that's what's in people's minds. That's the reason to think people remember when reading your text and going from sentence to sentence. You don't want that at the end. Okay. Basically, if this is the only thing, if this little tip is the only thing you take away from all these discussions we had here, that, that, that may be all that's necessary. From that follows a lot of the other things. Right? Maybe the additional thought, well, not many topics per paragraph. Then you're in good shape. Yes, I agree, this takes practice and practice and practice. Nobody, nobody was born a natural writer. This is just something like riding a bike. You need to do and to do and to do. And also gets, gets better. Okay. Um, yeah, this is not the right place. I think, I think I've said everything I want to say on this topic. So, to summarize. What these lights hope to give are some ideas, maybe guidelines, maybe make you sensitive to typical problems you, you run across. And I bet you do that in your own writing, and I bet you, write, you run across that when you read your, your peers' text, and I bet you run across this even more when you read scientific publications. This is, what's the phrase? The breach more honored in the, a custom more honored in the breach than in the observed. Basically, everybody breaks good language uh, rules, even though they are not bad ones. Practice, practice, practice. That's why I'm saying we're doing far too many, far too few seminars. This is so important. No matter what you do in your career, unless you end up doing website for the rest of your life and not get paid for it, this is what you will do. You will write technical texts. You will not write code. A couple of years into your career, you stop writing code and you stop and you start writing. Because otherwise you don't earn much money, or not good enough money. So you need to do that. Right. Um, and there's lots more than you can go for ways you can plot that. What I really recommend, and I, I, I say that again, the best 10 euros you can spend in your entire life, get this little book by just in terms of five years. This is in so few pages. And in such a nicely, charmingly written down style, the essence of a lot of writing problems and a lot of cures to these writing problems, it's just unbelievable. There's the little, little pocketbook version that's nine euro, 80 cents, something like that. Best money ever spent. Okay. for two days and then go back and read it with a, with, a, with a change of sign. Forget that it's your text. Just look at the structure, look at the grammar, does this make sense, it's easy to read. And that's also why we swap the texts in our mind. So you really get a stranger's view on your own text and that you also see other people's texts. You know this, this, this Bible quote, um, it's easier to see the, the splint in your brother's eye than the beam in your own. This is exactly that. I bet you'll be very 
picky and that they are picking out, ha, huh, there, this could be done better, coherent, right? But your own text, it's human nature, right? I do the same thing, it's the opposite. So, contrary, contrary to practice that a little bit. Okay? Excellent. Good. So my suggestion still is, uh, once we are getting closer to the actual talks, uh, once you've submitted your, your drafts, uh, once it then starts being time to do the slides, uh, we'll meet again and talk a bit about talking. Slide organization, time management in a talk, and so on and so forth. But that's, when's the deadline for that? Early June, right? End of May, something like that. So we'll do a doodle when, when this deadline comes up and then we'll sit down for another two hours and, and get this one done. I think it makes no sense to do this now. And thanks for your attention and have a good evening.